guys. You've been in Europe for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. Did you have any wild parties yet? Um, not on this trip, but on the last trip, we had quite a few parties with our friends in Maroon, and uh, I think we ended up at some strange gothic raves that were going on like three, four in the morning. I know that Lee did a little party in when he was over there in uh, Berlin. Want to talk about that? Uh, it was fun. We, we, uh, that was the first time, actually, right? That? Yeah, that was the first time. That was the first time. Okay. Well, both times. It, each time has been pretty fun that we've been over here. Yeah, I mean, we usually have a really good time over here, and it's been really awesome so far. Yeah, I think on the tour with you guys, Maroon broke Edge. So oh, no, some sure. of the guys. Yeah, I don't know. 15 years of straight Yeah, and they broke it. I, I think it was because of you guys, because of your party. I, I <laughs> nah, sure. They seem like seasoned drinkers when we, when we really? got on the tour, yeah. Like, Maybe um, it was just a joke. I don't know. No, I think that they were serious about it for a long time, but okay. it's just something they grew out of. We were we had a good time with those guys. It was a, it was a blast touring with them and Eyes of a Trader. So I was going to ask you, what's your favorite mixed drink on tour? Um, we don't really see too many of those. I mean, well, in Europe, I mean, usually we're you know we'll have beer and stuff like that. But um, I think um, a Bloody Mary is nice, but it's kind of hard to find over here. It depends on, uh, I think it depends on the time of the day. So, buddies are definitely in order early in the day. Uh, otherwise, for me, it's just uh, like a Jameson water or a margarita. Okay. Most of the things. And what do you guys do on tour to keep yourself entertained? Because there's a lot of waiting time. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, sometimes, you know, we'll bring extra instruments with us on tour. We'll practice backstage, bring some small like little practice amps, jam out, maybe come up with some new song ideas. Um, we've done recording backstage in the past, you know, with a laptop, um, like just brainstorming for new songs and stuff like that. And um, I don't know, we have like, you know, a couple iPads and like our, our phones and it's nice to be able to, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to friends and family back home. And um, yeah, that really passes the time quite well, actually. So your last record, uh, In Dreams, mm -hmm. it came out last year in autumn. Are you happy with how it came out or would you still... Oh yeah, it? for sure. Um, no, I wouldn't change anything. I think part, about, part of like releasing a, an album is like, you know, it is what it is and you need to move forward. And it, it sounds kind of weird that I say that since we've actually re-recorded one of our albums before. But that's because we were going through lineup changes and um, everyone wanted to do it and it just made sense at the time. As far as In Dreams go, I'm, I'm, I'm totally happy with it and um, I think it sounds great and I, I'm pretty stoked on it. Yeah, no, no re-release plans for In Dreams. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to be a re reoccurring dream. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's probably what we call it though. Uh, what does the yeah. title stand for? In Dreams? Yeah. Um, well, for some reason in this band we like to we always we like to talk about our dreams and tech, like I mean I think we all feel like this is our dream job you know uh, being professional musicians um, but the the subject of our dreams comes up a lot um, just in our daily conversations and um, so that's kind of that's kind of like early on when we were, we were writing and stuff like that I, I, I talked to Anthony about it and I'm like hey what do you think about you know and, and we were talking about just the ideas of dreams and and how how, how how to put that um just the, in the simplest way just in dreams um what like what happens well we're over here right now and um and we're when we're out on the road a lot of times we're, we're up late at night and we're doing things when our friends and our family back home are, are sleeping and and then you know our, our schedules get flipped around and i think that's part of it too just uh the whole idea of of uh us chasing our dreams and us talking about our dreams and that's where the album name comes from so you use the XFX to record the album? Um, actually, I can answer that. Yeah. Our album, actually, a lot of people think that we did um, use XFX on everything, but in, that's not the case. Um, we had everything uh, reamped in, in Sweden, in the okay. studio that our album's mixed in Macedon, which is called Beer and Loathing Studio. And um, actually, I'm pretty sure the only thing that was actually XFX on the album is the uh, bass. Okay. And the, the lead guitars and the rhythm guitars were reamped through an amplifier called the Fortin Natos, and it's a boutique amp that's made, I believe, somewhere in uh, the New England area of uh, the United States. And um, we, we were just super happy with the tone. And, uh, but the Axe Effects is something that we also use on a regular basis, like for touring and uh, like other recording projects we have at home and stuff like that. But 
it really is a great tool. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really like happy taking it on the road. It's got my um, my setup times. Like when I get to a, a venue for the show, just down to like about two minutes. Just plug in, get ready to go. It's um, it really is a great unit. Okay, so your your songs are very intricate. Um, how do you songs usually like take form? Is there like a, a, a particular approach? There's, there's no approach or method really, other than um, Trent and I both have like our home recording rigs, and uh, what we'll do is um, you know we can record an entire song and you know like just demo it and then give it to the band. If the band likes it, sometimes we just stick with it. Other times, what we'll do is we'll like literally just take sections out here and there, either scrap them, save them for other songs, and. Um, And then it usually just kind of comes together in the practice space. Like once we all like get set up, because it's one thing, because I can get into the zone if I'm recording on my, on my home computer rig. And I can kind of lose track of like, well, maybe this might not work with a band. It might just be with something more experimental and like something that might not really suit playing with like, you know, other musicians. And, and then that's when we really find out if it's going to actually stick or not is when we like, we get to the practice space and, you know, we plug our instruments in and we try to play the stuff. And if it makes sense, like, Everyone kind of started to nod their head and just like kind of know, like, yeah. It's like, it sounds sound. cool to us. It's like, yeah, yeah. these guys come with Justin Trent, the bulk of the, the riff writing. And uh, yeah, and like you said, like we get together in practice space and it's like, yeah, I mean, I feel like we're playing music that we think sounds cool. Like, we're like oh yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah, it's it's like, like, if it sounds good, we just go for yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. Like, And not even really think any second thought about it, you know? Yeah. So it didn't change in any way when Anthony came into the band? No, the, actually the only difference now is that um, since Anthony lives far away from us, he lives in California and the rest of the band, um, we live in Minnesota. And what we'll do is um, we'll spend some time emailing tracks back and forth and stuff like that. It's really easy for us to like get a, a demo of a song down, get a rough recording of it, email it to him. He can listen to it and start to write lyrics. And, um, And then he'll fly back to Minnesota every once in a while, and that's when we really start to like, um, you know, come together with everything. But at least doing that, he has a better like knowledge of like, you know, the stuff that we've been, the riffs and stuff that we've been working on back home. So he doesn't come into the studio and just be like, oh, you know, I'm not feeling this. Like he would already know. So my last question is going to be: um, I saw on your Facebook page that Trent, mm -hmm. he once met Dimebag when he was young. Yeah, yeah, it's and his, I think it's his number one. Icon. Okay, yeah. and I was going to ask you because um, I think in some ways the the real guitar heroes are dying out, and do you feel the same, or do you think there's there's like one guy there that could be the dying back of the twenty tens or something like that? Um, I know what you're saying, and I don't. I just don't honestly think that. I mean, I have so much respect for Dime Bag and like his legacy, and it'll probably. I mean, it's going to live on forever. I mean, I mean, far beyond our generations, I believe. And um, I don't think I could ever actually associate another name with him. I kind of feel like, you know, he, he's in the league of his own, he always has been, and he'll always be remembered as like, you know, as, as Dimebag and one of the greatest guitarists of all time. And it would be hard for me to associate another name with, uh, with that, but I mean, there are plenty of great guitarists out there, you know, and, um, you know, currently, you know, I've grown up listening to, you know, Dimebag is one of my favorite guitar players, and um, John Petrucci from Dream Theater is also one of my favorite guitarists, um, Fred Reed from Meshuggah, I don't know, Kirk Hammett, Metallica, like, these are all, you know, musicians that I've looked up to growing up, and Dime was always, like, you know, like, up there for me, like, is, like, you know, at the top, at the top of this game, and I just, I don't think, like, I don't think that his legacy is ever going to die, and I don't know, I, I, when I listen to Pantera right now, I still feel it's, like, every bit as relevant as it ever was, you know, and I think that's just always going to be that way, and that's really cool. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I think think about your question is uh, like is that guitar hero like that 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 person that's like changing things I, I don't think that will ever go away I think there's always like upcoming artists and, and players out there that you know that are just like beginning to shape you know their path in the, in the music world so yeah no one can ever fill Don's shoes obviously you know no one's ever gonna say he's the next Don you know you wouldn't think that but I think there's there's always room for someone to to break the ground and, and to To, to do things that, that not everybody's doing. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good musicians out there, just, just from the, the, the touring that I've done, like, I, I see it all the time, you know, and you're like, wow, that guy's amazing. Um, but just uh, the short time that Tosin and Bossy was in, uh, you know, in, um, in Born Osiris, we were on tour with him, and that guy, 
that guy's nuts. He's doing he's doing crazy stuff. Like it's pretty crazy. He's, he's doing he's, I mean he's breaking ground I think and yeah. you know and even like their new guitar player like Jason Richardson that kid is a shredder you know very young like, like he's really young he's got a lot of time ahead of him I mean there's, there's all kinds of musicians like that that I mean they just just need a little bit more time I think and that we're we're gonna see people breaking new ground and, and doing things that people haven't done and, and then, you know they can they can forge their own way and make their own legacies. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, great so time. Appreciate it. Awesome.